Hi there. One of the hot topics in the labour market at the moment, uh, in the UK and in the United States and many other countries, is the issue of executive pay. And in particular, the debate about whether the, the total pay of CEOs should be capped or limited in some way as a policy intervention in the labour market. So let's have a look at some of the evidence and some of the issues that you might want to put into an exam answer. Here's a chart showing the pay of CEOs and the pay of average workers in 2014 across different countries. And we find that in 2014, the ratio between the pay of the CEO and the average worker in the United States was a staggeringly high 354. That is an outlier in every respect, way higher than in Switzerland and Germany and Spain, of course, uh, in the UK, shown in this chart. Interestingly, in quite a few Scandinavian countries, for example, in Norway and Denmark, um, and to a lesser extent in Sweden, the ratio of pay between CEOs and average workers is much smaller. Those are countries with a much lower Gini coefficient. There's more income equality. To put the UK figure into perspective, uh, the median pay for chief executives, the middle value across the range of Britain's 350 biggest companies, uh, by share valuation, the median pay in 2014 was £1.9 million per year. And that's uh, over 80% higher than a decade ago. Public opinion in the United States uh, is quite firm in the sense that when asked the question, do you think CEOs are paid the correct amount relative to the average worker, uh, a clear majority, 75%, say no. 16% say yes, and uh, only one person in 10 doesn't really have an opinion on the matter. If one takes the, the highest pay of chief executives just in Britain, again, the data here is for 2014, just takes up some time for the information to become fully available. Uh, Sir Martin Sol, who is the founder and CEO of WPP, an advertising agency, again, he's way, he's way, out, way out ahead. In fact, he's probably second and third in terms of the last three or four years. But there are some significant businesses here, uh, you know, from Prudential to Experian to BP, where the CEOs are getting paid substantial amounts, £200,000 per week on average. And according to the High Pay Centre, the gap has tripled over the past 15 years. Here's one way of showing Sir Martin Sowell's total remuneration relative to the average UK wage for a full-time worker, which was £26,500 in, in 2015. Actually, Seoul's salary, we're told, is only just over a million pounds a year. <clears throat> but this is going to be topped up by things like share awards and cash bonuses. And uh, who knows, you know, the, the payout could be £70 million plus in 2015. Seoul is part of a long-term bonus scheme <clears throat> calculated based on the company's performance for the previous five years. But that, I think that gives you a sense of the scale of the difference between CEO pay uh, and the average worker in the UK. So what are some of the arguments for executive pay ceilings? Well, here are some arguments for saying, yes, we should have a pay ceiling in place. <clears throat> the first one is basically linked to the fundamental economic argument surrounding equity and fairness, that the gap in pay between executives and and uh, factory floor workers has, has become unacceptably high. That, of course, is a, a normative statement. And that this high ratio, this 300 plus ratio, can be damaging not just to corporate performance, but also to social cohesion as well. <clears throat> Oftentimes, shareholders if they have any power at all, they'll remain reluctant to impose significant limits on shareholder pay, uh, particularly at the annual general meeting. Many shareholders are essentially just passive investors in a company. I think a really crucial evaluation point is that the link between, between pay and performance can actually be quite hard to measure, to discern. First of all, you have to choose what measure you're going to use. Are you looking at rate of return on capital investment? Are you looking at the company's overall share performance? Are you looking at other other kind of metrics, market share, growth, etc. 
Recent research has suggested that the link between what the chief executives are paid and company performance is, is probably limited. In case you can make a case for saying it's negligible. So the justification for high executive pay isn't necessarily strong in terms of company performance in the long term. Indeed, you could argue that the bonus culture actually encourages quite short-term decision-making rather than executives focusing on the longer-term dynamics and strategy of growth, of diversification, of investment. They go for short-term profits because that amplifies their, their annual bonus. More widely, high levels of executive pay do contribute to increased income and wealth inequality, uh, although it has to be said that uh, CEOs oftentimes pay much more in tax and there aren't tens of thousands of CEOs, so though they're receiving huge incomes, in aggregate, those levels of incomes are not significantly higher than, for example, you know, the tens of thousands of shop floor workers. But there are some of the arguments for executive pay ceilings. Equally, <clears throat> there are arguments for saying, no, we shouldn't necessarily put a cap on executive pay. Here are some of the arguments. First of all, that uh, the risk is if you put a cap on pay that uh, talented people, uh, the best executives may decide not to use the UK for their domestic businesses. They may decide uh, they'll live and work in other countries. So we might suffer a brain drain effect or we might not be as attractive to the, to the, to the most talented entrepreneurs and executives. In that sense, the high pay, if set by the market, is, a, is an important price signal within the labour market. Uh, linked with that, if executives decide they don't want to live and work in the UK, some businesses might relocate overseas to countries where uh, top rate taxes are lower. The evidence for that, by the way, is extremely mixed. It's not very substantial. Interestingly, I think the third point is the idea of the unintended consequences, that if you put a cap on pay and bonuses, um, businesses will find other ways of, of rewarding their top executives. So we might, if you put a, a, a wage cap, they might just start to, to put in together complex share option schemes, which themselves don't necessarily improve corporate performance. The fourth point is the idea that there might be a better alternative to a pay cap. In other words, allow the market to set the wage, but have higher marginal tax rates on the top executive pay, perhaps above 45, above 50%. Uh, that might be a better option than capping. The other point at the bottom of the slide here is that if you say, if you pose a cap of, for the sake of argument, let's say you pose a cap of 20 times the pay of the average worker for all CEOs, that's actually going to cause significant variation in CEO pay. The average pay, for example, in caring and catering and clerical work is much, much lower than the average pay in, let's say, pharmaceuticals and car manufacturing. So imposing a uniform numerical multiple cap on executive pay actually will impact though differently across um, different sectors and different industries and that could be problematic. These arguments won't go away. Uh, it's well worth thinking about the economics of executive pay and maybe using labour demand and labour supply diagrams to, to help your analysis which of course is a prerequisite for good evaluation. Okay, thank you.